This week's episode is brought to you by our good, beautiful, incredible friends at Budgie Smuggler. And I'm so excited, so pumped, and so proud to announce that we have Dylan Friends Custom Budgie Smugglers available now. This is huge. This is big. It is the essential item for summer and also an incredible Christmas gift for your dad. You, budgiesmuggler.com.au. Yes. Mark Murphy, wow, the skip is in the house. Long time coming. So excited to see you. You look well. I feel good. Thanks, Dill. Thanks you for having good. me, mate. It's, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, mate. You normally you look, you look great. You look really good. <laughs> but you normally this time of year really bronzed, like with the preseason. And now you've, you know, the retirement, your office life now, I'm assuming, you know, nine to five is it's just the, the complexions. Yeah, lacking. Lacking a little bit. Well, yeah, 10 weeks into retirement, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously I look like I'm going shit ass. So no, you look great. That's good. You look really good. Um, but yeah, missing out on all the tan. Yeah. Um, but uh, the weather hasn't been that great. No. Of late. Well, the last two days have been good. But yeah. Other than that, it's been pretty poor still. So yeah, thanks. Thanks. Good start. No, I'm saying you look really good. That's what I'm saying. You look really handsome and you look great. So I just want to get that there. How's it been, mate? In, you know, the last, what, the boys are just going back to training now. What's it feeling like? How's the last, you know, retirement sort of been? Uh, it's well. It's been a, a weird one. Obviously, when you retire um, from football after 16 years, getting used to not having to worry about uh, getting yourself in good nick mm. um, has been good. But when you retire and you you go straight into lockdown, uh, it was probably a pretty pretty flattening sort of period because you obviously you finish your career. Usually, you'd go out and have a thousand beers with all all the boys, a thousand beers with past players like yourself. Yeah. Um, People that have been there on the journey with you the whole time, but literally had two beers in the rooms after the games, got done by 100 points, and went and hung out in my room for or my house for a good six or seven weeks. So uh, it wasn't ideal, but slowly starting to uh, to catch up with a few people now and have a few of those beers, which has been good. It is good, and it's always so good to see you, mate. Um, I did send you a nice message. You did get back to me, but it's an honour to have pulled on the boots with you. Um, you know, I didn't get to do it as much as I'd like to, but so proud of your career. Can't wait to unpack it today should be super proud of yourself and um yeah I, I think that this chat today is going to give such a good insight into you as a person you as a player but more importantly how good a bloke you are we're saying off camera before i think if you know 95 percent or even five percent of the people knew your story um and what you sort of been through through your career and, and again there's been a lot a lot of good times but some really shit that you've actually had to battle through that no one's known about me included um you probably should have just told some more people, man. It would have been a lot easier, I think. Well, <laughs> yeah, I suppose had a few injuries over the period yeah. and, uh, and battled through uh, quite a few years of just week to week getting up. Um, but yeah, I've sort of never been one to sort of complain and um, make excuses. So uh, yeah, body's pretty banged up. Um, but uh, that's part of football. I think the first five, six years, I think my body was in good nick and played some mm. pretty handy football. Um, I did have some good periods throughout the back end. I wasn't just a bucket of shit, to be honest with you. But no, no. And towards the end, no. but um, I certainly didn't reach the well, the level of what I was sort of I was building from sort of you know, 2008 to um, you know, halfway through 2012 when I was going pretty well, and then had a few injury setbacks, and then um, yeah, going through a tough period of obviously myself battling injury, um, bit of form, and then obviously the club going pretty pretty average was it was a tough period so um yeah sitting here as ex-players now we can hopefully watch some good times of the baggers mm. coming up and go mm. there and talk about how good we used to be um <laughs> yes we will definitely do that bananas, <laughs> kicking bananas for your first goal and yeah. telling telling me that's how you do it Murph, when you do that which <laughs> I think was, was that against Geelong was that it? was against Geelong yeah. I'll never forget that and you tell that story better than so most there's a few but... highlights of of playing with you and yeah. and training with you so <laughs> that was one of my playing highlights was being told that's how you do it and then uh when you had no eyebrows when you burnt them off that was another highlight we will talk just quickly tell that story I think a few people have heard it but I have to if you haven't it's pretty fucked and I still don't like to bring this up because it was very scary. And burning is not a joke. Burns are not no, a joke. Obviously not. They're not a joke. Um, but I was at home, um, burnt my face, basically. I lit the gas stove, blew up, burnt my face, um, really hurt. Like I'm talking, like, it was in a lot of pain. Like I was stinging, called the doc. We had two docs at the time. I think I called um, Voz first. And I was like, Voz, like, I've just burnt myself, trying to stay calm. I had a wet towel on my face. 
uh, he's like, oh, you know, you should be right. Just, you know, keep the wet towel on. Should be right. Anyway, the pain didn't go away. So I called Phil. And Phil, for, for reference, like he works at a emergency clinic, sees like the worst things happen. Yeah. Um, and he's a very calm sort of guy. And called him. He goes, oh, look, you know, you should be fine. Do this. Just send me a photo. So I've sent him a photo. Calls back straight away. goes, get to emergency straight away. <laughs> like straight away. So I've been driving to the hospital with a wet towel on my face all the way out to Knox. Get out there. Long story short, it was in the preseason, so no one saw me. Three, four weeks later, I think that, you know, my eyebrows are starting to grow back. I'm looking a little bit better. I didn't tell anyone about this because it was pretty embarrassing. Like I had no hair on my face. My foot, my, my hairline's already a metre back. It was two metres back because it burned it all <laughs> off. The first person I saw walking into the club was you. It was only from about 20 or 30 metres away. <laughs> 20, too, 20 or 30 metres away from me, you just said, what the fuck is wrong with your face? Well, it reminded me, and not many people would know this, I reckon I was probably seven or eight, and I actually got a hold of a shaver and shaved one of my eyebrows off. I don't know why I did it, but I've got pictures from Christmas when I was seven or eight in an Australian cricket hat um, <laughs> with no eyebrow. <laughs> It, it takes a long, that, yeah. So, well, it takes um, a long time to grow back. Yeah. So there's some good memories of. of yeah, there's good memories. That. Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of other ones we get through. Um, just talking quickly about uh, what you're going through at the moment with the, with the footy. It's pretty interesting. What uh, you know, your body at the moment. Give us a bit of an insight on what's happening, like with your shoulder. Yeah. So uh, I think I had my sixth operation on my shoulder um, end of this season. So. Uh, currently, I, I just got it shaved back. Basically, the ball and socket sits obviously shoulder. Had that shaved back, so it was basically like a mushroom. Mm. Um, so at the moment, I don't have a great range. Can't really lift my um, my hand above my shoulder, to be honest. So wow. getting a bit of uh, treatment on that twice a week. It should hopefully come good to the point where I can just function normally. I, don't, I won't be playing football or mm. getting on the tools as much. I'm, I'm really keen to get on the tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, had a had a few operations throughout the period and had a shoulder reco first year, broke shoulder um, in 2012, which sort of when I was going pretty well. Is that the big? Was that the big bump? That was a big bump. Danger so, field. Yeah, danger yeah. field broke that shoulder. And then had to go back in after that and get the nerve out of the shoulder, out of the bone. It was a bit of a bit of a mess. And then had another Rico in 2015. Um, and it wasn't actually until it was probably 10 weeks post-op. Was doing a 2K time trial, and I actually pinged my calf at about the K mark. Um, I still beat Gibbsy though, mind you. Yeah, it's, it's not, not really saying not too hard, much. No. Um, but uh, I sort of noticed a bit of fluid in my in my bicep when I went out to get my my scan for my my calf, and uh, Dr. Phil was like, uh, Bloomy goes, oh, we might actually get that looked at. That's obviously not normal. Um, found out I had a staph inf- infection in my in my shoulder. It's actually been eating away at my, my bone graft. So just on, what is a staph infection? Because I obviously know what that is, but some people... Well, go on staph. So definitely. like when you get operations, there's obviously the chance of getting infections. So right. it's basically like a bug that has obviously got in because your shoulder's <laughs> open for a good hour and a half Fuck. getting that operation. So you can get it, any surgeries dangerous because you can get an infection pretty easily mm. um yeah so i had had a staph infection went and back. how serious is that like that they're pretty bad well if you don't get on top of it early you can, you can lose limbs sometimes but um that's obviously the yeah. extreme but and michael hurley's going through that at the moment isn't he I think he had a, a staph infection as well yeah. so um and that obviously went through to his I think his liver and oh, stuff, yeah. i think Fuck. too sure i'm not sure that exactly yep. what he had but yep. i know he had an infection from his hip from from an operation so um yeah had that in my shoulder when got that cleaned out and then managed to somehow get up for round one play that year um but sort of from 2017 to 2018 i sort of noticed starting to really drop away and i couldn't really lift a weight for the last two years uh couldn't um reach out to my left so or or mark above my head but um not that i'd I took too many marks above my head, Buckets, so it wasn't too bad. But um, yeah, I was sort of pretty pretty hamstrung the last couple of years and uh, I need to get a shoulder replacement, but apparently they're no good, they're no good until you're 65. So I've got to wait 30 years for that or uh, or wait for um, technology to advance and, and hopefully get a replacement soon. But um, yeah, just got to, got to put up with it, unfortunately. It's pretty like, it's scary, isn't it? Like in a way, I know you're, you're speaking about it now, but in a way when you finish footy, and to a very less extent, even when I finished and I was really struggling to get my back moving, 
And I was like, fuck me, this is like, you, you don't think about this when you're actually playing until after and you go, I genuinely can't move right now, like I'm cooked. Yeah, well, I think very rarely do, do blokes have a career where they're not battling mm. different types of injuries at some point. Like everyone who plays AFL or top line sport has something going on which um, you've got to put up with to a certain extent. The last couple of years was, was pretty tough for me, but um, yeah, post uh, career now, I'm sort of just worried about being able to just function daily. Um, and my knee's been good, which is which is handy, but yeah, the shoulders, yeah, it's quite laughable how bad it is for a 34-year-old to not be able to lift your, your shoulder. Um, but yeah, hopefully this operation, a bit of physio treatment can get to a point where I can, can function and and, uh, and hold the kids above my head, which would be nice. But um, yeah. yeah, that's unfortunately, you don't play a 16-year career with having some sort of issue post and yeah, the shoulder's mine. When you're carrying the boys on the back and the, the shoulders do get very sore as well. Well, that's, yeah, that was Juddie's comment back in. Me, too. I think, me, you and Juddie, yeah, yeah, shoulders. I think that was Juddie's comment back against uh, the Eagles. Yeah. I think when um, someone sledged him and he said, well, yeah, the shoulders are stuff from carrying you blokes for the last four or five years. Was, <laughs> we love that. It was pretty funny, so we love that. We love it. Hey, let's um, get off the industry a bit. I'm sure we'll pop back to it later because there's a few more. But early life for Mark Murphy, you make it very well known that you – probably could have been test captain and probably <laughs> maybe even at this stage right now it was yeah. you know the, the sliding doors moment you could have been going into that prime real estate of test captain right now well you're right and i know i think you've had finch i on did show, and he, he mentioned Which, mentioned how good you were well i did listen to that and it was yeah. it was a very flat individual hearing that the lady i was a better player than me well he yeah. he said that anyway which i'd probably agree with anyway but um yeah, it was, it was quite funny. I had a lot of messages uh, for my 300th and last game and Finchie was one of them. Yeah. And um, he actually said, I chose the right sport because I was, I was shit-ass back <laughs> I wasn't shit-ass, but I was never going to make it to the level that obviously he has, which has been great to see. But um, yeah, had that, that opportunity to, to um, pursue cricket when I was 16, 17. And mm. I got, uh, got cut at 55 for Vic Metro under 16s. In footy? In footy. Yeah. And it always, it always played um, high-level cricket, played all the state sides with uh, great man Finchie and got to the AIS with, with him. And then, um, yeah, footy came around and I managed to go okay. But after that, under-16s Metro, um, or missing out on that carnival and being cut at 55 because mm. I was too, too small and too slow. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, I think I'll just concentrate on cricket. Uh, and I was sort of, I was, I was really lucky that the, the under 18 coach at the time, Neil Ross, uh, he said, well, pre-season, I know you've got a lot with cricket going on. If you can come down once a week, uh, that's all you need to really do. And then, you know, four weeks out from the season starting, that's when we want you here a bit more. Mm. Um, so that was really handy because at the, at the time I, I hated going to Oakley Chargers. Really? I just I hated the trying out for, for teams, for football. I just don't know what it was. I just didn't like the, the environment that much. And um, I enjoyed the, the aspect of playing cricket, a smaller group of blokes. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, Comfortable, yeah. Sort of, I was probably better at it, so yeah, that's probably right. why I enjoyed it more. But uh, I went to that Oakley start a pre-season thinking well if he wants me down here three days a week I'll just I'll call it and I'll just concentrate on my cricket so I was pretty lucky he said bottom age under 18 so we'll just come down once a week and then yeah, as I said four weeks out from from round one we want we here twice a week played really well at the start of that season played metro under 18s went really well in that uh, in that tour in that championship and then yeah, never looked back really but what, like, that's pretty nuts like, to think that you didn't make under 16s i didn't know that and then you, the next year under your under 17s playing 18s yeah you win the best player for vic metro no nah, i came second in the bnf no no i'm pretty sure you won it did i i can't remember i don't know i sure. think i think you won maybe best player at the comp in the in the in the nah, that was the next year the so next year yeah the next year so what happened though because i know you just said then you've just gone and you played lucky but did something change like mentally for you or was it just i think i just i was i, was, I thought i was i played well in the under 16 metro games yeah i just, just didn't pick it like i wasn't developed as some of the other guys like i was right as you can see i'm a big strapping individual now you but, are a big boy uh, when i was 15 i was obviously pretty small more yeah. of a forward pocket uh guys are more mature than me at that stage and i still reckon i played really well i was probably a bit bit um yeah i thought it shafted not to get into the okay 
into the squad, but missed out. Um, that's part of it and sort of had my back up about it and, and just wanted to prove a point really and, and played really well early stages of under-18s and Dave Dixon, who was a coach of the under-18s, uh, yeah, was really keen for me to play. Played really well in the Metro. Um, Colours won the championship there and then was in the AIS squad after that for football. And then, yeah, played really well under-18s and ended up getting drafted. Yeah, the draft story is... is- Crazy because your you're father son pick your old man played with Fitzroy, yeah, and Hawthorne. No, so um, what's the connection play, with so, Hawthorne? So Hawthorne, my grandfather played 130 games there. So it's actually quite funny. So I don't know, do you want to finish your question or you no, want just to go on? You take. Okay. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know, grandfather played 130 odd for for Hawthorne, mm. and was it was a Dower fullback. So fullback. Uh, <laughs> one two B and there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, my old man um, and myself obviously didn't get that defending aspect of our no. of his sort yeah. of dourness in defence. <laughs> <laughs> we were obviously midfielders, but uh, yeah. So he, the old man, grew up in Heidelberg, mm-hmm. and so it was all zoned back then. So he grew up in the Fitzroy zone, and had the chance to go father and son to Hawthorne. I think Fitzroy offered him uh, more money, and I think the fact of playing with guys he was comfortable with. So Heidelberg was. Uh, more the you know, the blue collar um, people, and he, he enjoyed that. Whereas mm. the Hawthorne zone was obviously a little bit more different, yep. a bit more affluent. Uh, and he thought, oh, I'd rather play with my mates, get more money, and um, pursue a, a career at, at Fitzroy. Um, so turn his back on the father and son there. And I think throughout that, uh, so the old man played 240 odd games for Fitzroy, and he won six BNFs there played in one final, but that was at North Melbourne when he went there, the final year of his career. And, um, yeah, I think during that that period where the old man could have gone to Hawthorne, I think they won four or five flags during yeah. that period, and, and so he missed out on all those. Um, and then, yeah, it got to my decision between whether I go to, to Brisbane underneath the father and son rule or there was, you know, Carlton, Collingwood, Hawthorne, Essendon, all of the top nine picks. So I knew... I was going to stay in stay in Melbourne if I um, nominated for the draft. Thought I'd rather stay here, be with family, friends, go to Carlton, which is a huge club. And obviously at the time they were they were going pretty poor. I thought mm. there's a chance to sort of um, play a huge club, make a real statement, bring them back up the ladder, and be part of that. That was that was my uh, that was my aim, and that was something I was really excited about. So. Yeah, turn my back on going. So both my old man and myself both. turn her turn her back. Because you'd have to be both. Son. Yeah, like I don't know. We we'll have to get some, someone will know listening, but there's not many father sons that really don't. No, we're yeah. interesting breed. Yeah, Murphys, but yeah, um, I do blame the old man on costing us about ten flags. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it is what it is. But um, yeah, we we all have forged our own careers yeah. at different clubs, and um, yeah, the old man went had a pretty amazing career really looking back some of Did. his stats and obviously a hall of famer tough being a son of a hall of famer isn't it bucker yeah it is but um yes it uh yeah yeah he had a great career but unfortunately none of us have won a flag so oh i've won a 15 so, um i won one so me and dad got three as well one and a half each with yeah i won 15s so. too so yeah cool times. um when you went up to brizzy they would have put on i'm assuming put on a show for you to try and get you to stay up there what was what was that like Cause at the time jonathan brown luke power who's now at the blues too yeah yep. nigel lappin one of my favourites. Yeah, Acker. Acker. Yeah. Um, oh, look, it was awesome. So that was, I went up there and trained uh, as part of the AIS squad. You go and do a, a training oh. period at, at footy clubs and obviously having that Fitzroy um, connection, I went up there for two weeks and stayed with um, Craig Starsevich, who was like the head of um, performance up there. Started there for two weeks and uh, yeah, trained, loved loved every minute of it. And that was 2004, so I've come off uh, 2001, two, three, win flags, They've got all these superstars. I loved Vossi uh, and I loved Juddy, so that's why I wore number three mm. um, initially. And uh, yeah, so you're training with Vossi, Jonathan Brown, Ackermanis, Lappin, Power, um, Simon Black. Like, it was the best. Mm. Loved it. And it was probably in my under um, 18s first year when I couldn't get drafted. If I could have been drafted Brisbane, I reckon I would have definitely gone As that a year. bottom major? As a bottom major because <clears throat> I'm not sure who had the first few picks um that year but 
I think I certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone in the top few picks and it would have been more of a, a raffle probably at that yep. point. And yeah, I had a great time at Brisbane, um, but couldn't get drafted. So uh, yeah, had a, had a four year deal start of my under 18 year to, to go to Brisbane. So obviously the, the initial two years at uh, when you get drafted, you get that initial two years and then two on top of that. And it was almost, it almost worked against them a little bit. I was like, well, I don't really want to do a, a four year deal. Like I've, I'm not sure if I want to live up there and be up there for four years. I was a bit, yeah. yeah, unsure about it. But then obviously once all the Melbourne-based clubs were down the bottom and I was going pretty well, I knew I'd stay at Carlton or Collingwood or something like that. It was, it was a pretty easy choice. But, yeah, they, they were a great club and um, I went in the rooms most, most weeks when they played in Melbourne and, yeah, they were coached by Lee Matthews. Yeah. Um, so I had to make a few... Uh, interesting phone calls. What, were they, what did you, what did Lethal Lee say when you said? Um, <laughs> he wasn't too he wasn't too bad. So yeah, put it in context. Had to go down to the den in the rumpus room yeah. at, at home. Oh, face to face? No, I was no, on, on the, the phone because yeah. they were up in Brisbane. Right. And by I think the, it was two weeks to go in the season. Yeah. I had to let them know to what was happening. Um, so I had to, I called Kenny Beetson, who was a rec- recruiting manager at the time. I called Craig Lambert, who was um, assistant there. Yep. Who was who was brilliant. Um, the whole way through and called Lee Matthews just to let them know that I wasn't coming. So it was a pretty um, big initiation to start <laughs> when you're an 18 year old kid and you're calling Lee Matthews best player of all time, yeah. um, three time premiership coach and say, no, look Lee, I think thanks for, thanks for everything, mate, but I'm, I'm not coming. <laughs> what did he say? Uh, he was just like, no worries, Mark, all the best, mate. And that was Is about that it. it? Yeah. yeah. So he gave me a bit at the start of the phone call. And then I think once I told him, he was like, yeah. oh, we'll move on. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think Jonathan Brown was too happy by the first few years that I played against against Brisbane. Yeah, um, yeah, I was, I was pretty targeted, I think, in the <laughs> first few years. But um, yeah, it was that was a pretty a tough. It was a tough night when I had to make those three phone calls and and obviously let them know that I was nominating for the draft. Jeez, he's a scary man on the field. He's such a such a star. Love love Jono. Um, all right, so you pick up Carlton. Fantastic, you're there, number three. Everything's looking incredible. Your first year. He's unbelievable. You play every game? No, I did um, did my shoulder in oh, the yeah. 13th game against, against Brisbane. Brisbane. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it was going pretty well and almost I probably had the rising star on the bag at that point, did my shoulder and then that was sort of, that was it for my first year. What was it like in all seriousness getting in there at that stage and not to, to bash the club or, or anyone that was involved, but it's probably widely known that at that stage the club was lacking a bit of leadership. Um, they didn't, probably didn't have the right leaders or culture at that stage do you remember your first couple of years was there anything that stands out you're just like oh this isn't right well i think you work out pretty quickly who um are the really hard workers and you try and latch onto them and and follow everything that they do and Unfo- like we had great great players and they were um they were good people but they weren't necessarily great leaders who were our, our real stars like i love fev but fev's He's not the the leader that a young bloke can come in and go. Yeah, I'll yeah. follow everything. And he would he, he would have said and that. He'd, yeah, he'd, yeah. He'd, he'd he'd attest to that as well. Um, he'd actually took me under his wing a bit, Fev, and <laughs> uh, you know, you'd go out with Fev and have four or five beers, which would be great. And then I'd end up having to look after him. And yeah. I was at like eighteen or nineteen. So, um, but uh, yeah, we we didn't have a, a really strong leadership um, or program or players who were our best players yeah. that you could easily follow. So um, there was a, a fair bit of work to do. When um, when I first got down there, but when you come as an 18 year old and you come into an AFL club, I'm not going to sit there and challenge um, blokes about how they they go about it because what do I know when mm. they've been around for for 10 years playing AFL football? But um, yeah, you quickly learn after a couple of years that the joint need to be turned on its head a bit, and we we're really lucky that the Juddy came in that my third year, and and guys could really see what professional football um, was about and and why he was so good. It wasn't just because he was talented. Um, it's about hard work. So he was great for, for turning that around and, and everyone basically jumped on. And if you didn't want to jump on, then you, you weren't going to last. So, um, yeah, the initial 24 months at the start was, yeah, we were a long way off the pace. Wow. First, who was your first coach? Was it Rats? No, Dennis Pagan. Yeah, Pags. Yeah. And then into Rats? And into Rats. Yeah. Okay. So Dennis Pagan, one year? No, so I had him for a year and a half. Yep. Um, look, Dennis was great for me. Like he backed me in. Um, he probably looked after me a lot because I was obviously their first number one pick, yeah. and um, I was going pretty well. And so I got along with him really well. 
but yeah, you could just you could tell that the playing group weren't right behind him. Like when you're you're not winning most weeks, and um, it was a very compared to what it is now, it was very old school. Um, and he come from that that background of doing old school things to to get guys up and and to that's the way he'd always coach but he was great for me but um yeah rats was my assistant coach that i did all my vision with and yeah. um he was yeah he was great for me in terms of even if i played really well there was always something that i could improve on conversely if i didn't do something or had a, a poor game there was always some aspect which there was a positive in it so you weren't necessarily riding that roller coaster with rats um which you know, some coaches find difficult from times, but he was he was great for keeping me pretty level and, and always pushing me. Yeah, two thousand and nine, ten, eleven were, and twelve, probably four of your best years, peaky yeah. powers. Rats there as well at that time. The club finishes in twenty twelve. It was a prelim against no, West so Coast or twenty twenty eleven. We um, lost by two or three points. Over in uh, over in the west against West yep. Coast to um, to miss out in a prelim, but yeah, that was when we were really really humming, and you know, I think everyone probably thought we were on that upward directory of you know next year. That's when we really start challenging and start of 2012. We were flying, and then we had a, f- a few injuries to a few key players, and yep. just missed out in finals. And then unfortunately, um, yeah, Rats got the flick, and yeah, Mick was was brought in. What do you what, what do you think now, like looking back at the decision of of getting rid of rats like do you think that it was the right decision to be made at the time um you look back and you think fuck the club was pretty prime like Juddy's brought in you're in incredible form gives there, air cruises there simo like yeah you look at a club i think carlton sports look back and go fuck we were pretty pretty good at that stage mm. um i know mick was brought in to hopefully take to the next level yeah um it didn't pan out that way in hindsight was it the right decision or do you think now is still the right one to be made no it was definitely the wrong decision but yeah. I think 2011, you need luck at the pointy end of the season and Gibbsy and Cruz both missed that final over in the West. Um, so you, you need your best players uh, and you see that with the teams that go on and win it. Like very few of them miss their best, they're two of the best, probably six players in the team at that point. Mm. So we'll, we'll stiff, we missed by two points, two or three points against West Coast and then uh, that year playing, if we got through that, I know it's all ifs and, and buts, but... You get through that game and you, you play Geelong at the G the following week and we played against them and we were too quick for the Cats. So you never know in a prelim what, what happens, but I thought we had their measure at that at that point. We were just probably a bit more dynamic. Our, our forwards were pretty incredible, like the, the three amigos and mm-hmm. you include um, Wadey. Uh, there's some pretty, some pretty talented players in there who they wouldn't have got overawed by the occasion because they just played footy and they, they had great chemistry down there. And our midfield is pretty dynamic, and uh, yeah, so you never know what happens from there. I think Collingwood would probably easily the best the best side yep. that year. So whether or not you you, you, know, you win the prelim and you get and play against Collingwood, and who knows what happens in a grand final. But um, so we missed our best player, a couple of our best players, miss out on that. And then the start of 2012, we played against Essendon. And I think we, were, we won our first three, played against them, and. That was when they were looking pretty big and pretty fit at that point, 2012. Yes. And Carazzo... Shoulder. Broken shoulder. And then Laidler, did he hurt his knee? Dislocated kneecap. And a couple of weeks later, I did my shoulder. And I think there was, a few, there was maybe one or two others that, that went down. And not to say, like, you, you needed... Good sides can cover losses. So yep. we probably weren't at that level. The depth, but yep. the depth, you're right. But um, we just missed finals... It was a tough year, but I think because we were expected to go on from 2011 to 2012, we were premiership favourites after round three, which smacked up Collingwood, who uh, who had gone down to Geelong in that in that grand final the year before. We been about ten goals or something, so we we're, were flying. And then yeah, the midway point of the year, we organised a bit of a lock in with the boys just to try and change something up, and we ended up going on a bit of a run, but just missed out in finals. Um, and then obviously the decision to get to get Mick. It was like, well, he can take us to the next level. Obviously, that's the thinking going on with the hierarchy at the time. But um, I just think the support that needed to be better around Rats to to help him, I think, was the way forward. I know hindsight's easy to say that now because everyone at the time was probably thinking, well, Mick was one year out of, of coaching. He's the, he's the guy who has been proven to to get to to get teams to, to grand finals anyway. So you can understand that decision. But 
yeah, hindsight looking back and at the time I'd, I had a great relationship with rats and I was sort of left a little bit disappointed because I know rats and I've spoken to rats and Juddy quite a bit throughout that 2012 year about taking over the captaincy after that year and um, yeah, I was pretty excited about doing that underneath rats and that all sort of changed. It's a big one, isn't it? I think that traditionally and history shows that like this isn't a bashing of the club at, at all what I'm saying but I think sometimes these reactive decisions are always made a little bit too quickly and I'm hoping that now with what they're doing, um, you know, bringing in Vossi, they've brought in a lot of new people. Um, I think that this is the final time that you can stop just getting rid of footy departments and coaches and I think the main point you said then is bringing in people to support rather than replacing a whole department because you really mm. do, you are starting from the start again and that's probably been the hardest thing for me as a fan now looking at the last from rats to you know even being there playing and still being a fan you're looking at what the fuck like you can't just change this shit all the time no. it just it takes time you've got to back each other in um and you look at things like how the club was going things can change in a two three week period if you just back each other in and see it see each other out like yeah i i don't want to bring this up for carlton tragics they might cry but you look at those pivotal moments like damon hardwick had um and Alistair Clarkson had where it goes either way for them mm. and they decide to keep them yeah. and things come together. Yeah. And that's what, you know, I feel like that was that defining moment for yeah. Carlton. Yeah. I was, I was thinking there'd been so much investment in rats and we were, we were progressing really well. And unfortunately through injury and circumstance, I think it was too quick just to go, mm. now we'll go in another direction. And then it, essentially you end up having to go backwards before you go up again, yeah. really. Like very rarely do, will someone come in a new coach and just go bounce straight away. Mm. Um, so I think I think the support and the communication need to be better at that time. I, I was never one for going upstairs, so to speak, and getting involved in all that in all that chat. Like I was dealing with coaches, not necessarily getting involved with CEOs and all that, and the rest of it about who appoints people and, and everything. But yeah, I, was, I think yeah, as I said before, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But it was a I think it was a bad move. Mm. Okay. Good one. Now, going forward, uh, Mick taking over, um, it's been, you know, publicly reported now that probably wasn't as smooth sailing as both parties or all parties would have liked that to be. And I know we, we spoke about this before, but you have to sort of talk about the relationship, how that sort of planned out from the start. You, you know, you were made captain as soon as that did come in and it did start on a positive, but then, you know, even now he's gone probably publicly on record. It's even hard for me to say this because I don't agree with it at all, but he would say that he said that, uh, if he had his time again, he wouldn't have made that a call. Is that right? I th- yeah, I, I, I actually haven't really listened to too much of what Mick has had to say yeah. um, post leaving the footy club because, yeah, um, yeah what's the point? Uh, but he probably would have said that he would have chosen a different captain at the time and um, he even said that to me when I got appointed captain. So um, When you got appointed captain? Yeah. So, so when we chose, <laughs> chose you as captain? Yeah. He would, have, he would have gone with someone else. But because they weren't going to be featuring regularly in the side, you couldn't go down that path. So initially when you get um, told your captain, you'd like to be a real positive sort of, sort of period. So it wasn't a great start. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's, that was his prerogative. But um, it would have been nice for him to turn up to a leadership group meeting every now and again mm. with us. But anyway, was, there's no point in me coming out yeah. and bashing Mick Mouldhouse because yeah. obviously one of the great coaches of all time um, – got the record for longest coaching so what am i going to do in terms of coming out and, and slamming him but yep. i just think his time at carlton i don't think he was really in it for the the right reasons um and then once it turned pear shape it was all about him unfortunately at the end and yeah i was sort of left to be thrown at the bus quite a bit but um yeah he uh he was obviously a terrific coach but unfortunately at Carlton for us and for me and for the boys who were there working so hard it just it didn't didn't work out how hard was that for you um obvious question but having been a captain of a club um things are taking a downward spiral you probably don't have the relationship or uh the you know the ins and outs of what's going on with the coaching staff versus yourself it must be it, it must have really been I, I feel fucking bad even looking at it now not that I could have done anything but it must have been a pretty lonely place I was probably the most lonely I've ever been, to be honest with you. I, like there was times I just hated turning up to the footy club, and that's which is sad to say when you um, spend a lot of your your life at a place where you should love, and that I, I loved for quite a fair bit of of my time there. There was times there where I just hated turning up. Um, so yeah, it was it was extremely difficult 
but you know, Mick was a very autocratic leader. Like was all he, whatever he said, uh, basically goes. Um, I could have my input, but I, ne- I couldn't get really any traction whatsoever. Like I felt the best thing that I could do was just having great connections with teammates mm. and, um, and then obviously trying to take on the load of when obviously things weren't going too well. Um, I'd rather take it on rather than other guys cop the heat. So, um, yeah, I was, I was, you had layers of being a number one pick, Carlton captain form just at the time. And then, um, yeah, when your club should be going upwards and we're going down. And at the time, obviously media, they came for Mick as well. Um, Cause he was such a, uh, well, he didn't have a great relationship with the, with the media. Like he was always pretty, um, he'd always probably talk down to them a little bit, mm. but um, that was, that was fine. That's the way he wanted to go about it. But so the heat was extreme pressure, especially when you had Carlton who should be going well and Mick Malthouse, your coach. So the heat was always going to come, come with me and which it did. It's unbelievable, mate. Like I think a lot of people listening to this now and even me sitting here and I was in, I was there not even knowing this, you, the resilience you have and the way you would never bitch and moan. Ne- like I didn't even know this stuff till now. It's nothing short of a credit to you. Like it is actually unbelievable how you put up with this stuff, how you still just carried on, put the team first, put your teammates first, always tried to make connections, put yourself in front of the team. It's honestly un- unbelievable how you did. Like I, I, I would love to know like what you actually were focusing on and who kept you like sane in that period or, or what you were even doing <coughs> to, to stay on task. Yeah, well, to be honest, I can't really remember. It's almost like I've got um, PSD. Yeah, <laughs> fuck. Um, it's, uh, I was actually trying to think about well, once you, you finish your career, you sort of try and reflect a little bit and reflect over the, that period. And I, like a lot of it I can't actually remember until I get prompted sometimes. So there's no doubt I've, I've squashed it away some, somewhere. But I think a lot of the – towards the back end of it, I was like more just thinking about younger guys, how I can try and help them um, by staying positive like because – no matter what you say, guys always pick up on your body language and how you carry yourself. So mm. that was one thing that every day before I'd walk into the footy club, like especially when you're, you're not winning and your form's indifferent and there's a lot of heat, if you're still positive and um, trying to, uh, still trying to grow certain blokes, like they, they pick up on everything that you do. So there's no point coming in and, and saying, oh, fuck, how poor me. Yeah, because um, that just self implode. That the joint will just implode. Well, it does. Um, and I've told the story forty five times. I won't do it again, ever again. But I was that person, and I wasn't going through anything that you were going through. Like I was soaking up. I was being a cancer in a club because things weren't going my way. Um, and I feel I feel like a lot of people did that, but you going through so much more, you didn't. So you got to you've really got to hold your head high at that because it's it says more about you as a person than than a lot of other people at. at at footy clubs and in, you know, in general. Um, so big, big credit to you there. A lot of people in that situation would have left. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was, I sort of, I, um, I've discussed this with a few people over the past 12 weeks, um, just about my career and everything. And I sort of felt that, you know, I was coming in every week or daily and, um, pushing a, a story for us or trying to grow blokes and grow the footy club. Uh, what sort of leader would I have been if I would you know, pulled the pin and opted out? Um, and I felt that like I owed it to my teammates to to see it out and to and and also at the same time I always thought that you know there's always going to be a period of, of really hard times when you're trying to build a, a group up and a club. And I was always hoping that I was going to have that Shane Crawford story yeah. where I was going to finish up on this high and, and finish as a premiership player. Uh, and the only way well, the only place I wanted to do that was at Carlton. I, I didn't really feel that if I'd achieved it somewhere else, but who knows, if I achieved it somewhere else, it'll have that, that sense of pride that I would at Carlton. Unfortunately, didn't pan out, but um, hopefully watching the guys this year and over the, 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 you know, the next coming years, hopefully they get that success and I can be part of the reason why certain blokes are still at that footy club and, and achieving that success. You definitely will be. Um, I think Liam Stocker said it beautifully at the BNF. He, you know, made it clear the impact that you've had on him and not just him, but everyone else at that club. Um, so, yeah, I think you've, you've definitely left a legacy, um, which I'm sure a lot of Carlton fans and, and AFL fans will have an insight in today that we're chatting. 
I know there was offers on the table to leave um, and you were extremely loyal to the club. You wanted to stay and, you, you know, 300 game player, absolutely huge and should be extremely proud of yourself. But was there ever any times that it was nearly, you thought, fuck, I've got to get out of here and do something different or, well, I know there was, but who, who was knocking? Yeah, there was, there was probably only one real strong chance that I was actually really considering leaving. Uh, when the foundation teams were coming in, there was, there was offers, but they weren't anything that was going to you know, take me out of Carlton at that time. So that was, you know, 2011, 12, and I was playing great football. Yep. Club was really on the up. Uh, loved playing in front of big crowds, playing at Carlton. I thought, you know, we're, we're going to win a flag, if not more. Like, I just thought that's where we were, we were going to get to. So there was never really any, any chance of leaving at that point. I think start of... Um, sort of middle of 2014 I've, I just ha- almost had enough at Carlton but um, I was like I'll stick it out for one more year again start of 2015 was really tough again uh, and I think if Mick was still there like I was definitely definitely out and so 2015 moving on was certainly um, I was in a position to do that I think mentally I sort of needed it mm. uh, but things progressed where obviously Mick was let go and then I thought well, here's an opportunity to try and build the place up again I'll stick stick it out uh but like the the main the main team was Richmond at that point so um caught up with them on a couple of occasions and uh yeah just I got to the point where I needed to do a medical and um it sort of just sort of really hit to me I was like I don't think I can leave um as I said to you before mm. like I'd spent so many years at the footy club. So I've been there nine or 10 years, but especially over that, that previous two, three years, I'd been, you know, preaching to certain blokes about stay, staying, um, sticking fat and working hard and, you know, we'll enjoy the, the fruits of our, our hard labour in years to come. And I still felt at that time I was going to be able to get back to my best when need to start to come back a little bit. Like mm-hmm. I had a pretty, pretty tough couple of years um, with a lot of chondral issues with my, my right knee and was starting to get on top of that and starting to um, play some good footy again. I think 2015, was, I was playing some pretty good football still. BNF? No, I lost to a crypt by a vote. But, um, Which year did you beat him? Uh, 17, I won 17. it. But, um, yes, yeah, so I, was, I was still playing all right football. I still felt like I was only, what was I? Maybe been 28. I don't know what I was. <laughs> Years go by. They do go yeah, by, yeah. yeah fucker. But um, that was the only real chance to leave, and I was, I was considering it. And then once, um, once Mick had left, and I felt like this is the opportunity to to build something really special. With I think Cripper's into his third year. Um, guys, I could really see that we're going to be there for a long period of time. I thought we had some really good leaders um, developing, so uh, that was the decision. So, yeah. Um, Chris Yaron went to Richmond at that time was almost if they hadn't committed to him it might have been a different story because yep. it might have progressed a little bit earlier but yeah at the same point it was still like just in my heart I just didn't feel like I could leave so um, my head was sort of telling me to get out and um, but yeah my heart sort of made me stay yeah I think a lot of Blues fans would be very just this like very happy with that. Like, that could have really ruined some people. I think oh. Damon he is a big. He was he's just about to start crying. I think you okay? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. It's an emotional time. Yeah, it's a very emotional time. When Bolts came in, um, something again that speaks to your character was you know when that that transition of the captaincy was looking at happening. Um, you know Doc and and Crip were going to take over the co captaincy, and and that was looking like that was going to happen at the club, but you sort of said to the boys, look, I think there's still going to be a couple of hard years to go. Let me take it for another year or so and, and I'll wear the brunt until I think it's a good time and it's a little, going to be a little bit easier for you. Look, Bolts, when he first got to the club, I think it was really great in terms of just putting some structure back in place to the place and um, I've got no doubt it, it helped a lot of a lot of blokes. We've gone from a program which is very sort of yep. um, yeah old school and you know, blokes had sort of lost a lot of passion and we're investing a heap as you as you can remember yep. in in knowledge of the game and yes um which looking back you think well, maybe it was a bit too much but mm-hmm. i think at that time it was sort of needed for the group but it probably could have dropped off a little bit yeah. after that but back to your question i think yeah i sort of still felt that there was a there was a bit of pain to come and i'd known how hard it was being a captain a during a period when you're at a big club and uh there's a lot of weight and a lot of pressure still on um, 
you know, performance of the football club and that was still pretty pretty young. Doc's a little bit older than Cripper by a couple of years, I think. A couple of years, yeah. Um, but I thought, well, these two can still develop and almost half run the team anyway as it is and I can still do the front of house stuff, which is always exciting, dealing mm. with sponsors and stakeholders and all the media side of things when you're not winning week to week. It's... Um, it's extremely draining and I thought it's better off um, those guys waiting another year. So it was basically a year out for like, I'll, I'll do another year and then you guys take over um, end of the season um, and was thinking that that was going to be their, their chance for a bit of blue skies. Yeah. Uh, yep. So um, I, f- I felt that, um, yeah, the, sort of the, the amount of pressure and weight that I had over that period, I thought well, I'd rather let these guys have another 12 months of enjoying their football, so to speak, and then worry about that down the track. Can I tell you something? I just remembered something about your leadership, and it's funny that I bring this up because I've never told this story, but I do think about it a lot. And you taught me a very valuable lesson one day, and I don't want to pump up how much it actually has affected me, but it really, really has. And you might not even remember it, but I remember one day... Um, I was at training and obviously, you know, I like to joke around and be, be silly. And I just remember you coming up to me and you sort of like grabbed me and you just said, look, man, like we love you. We love your attitude. But when you get on the field, shut the fuck up and just work hard. And I get goosebumps now thinking about it. Cause like at the time I'd never had feedback before. Like it was pretty fucking like straight in the eye. And I remembered that and I like, I remember it today as well. Like I remember it to even when I'm in work now, like I go, right, I'm going to have fun when people get here, I play table tennis, but when we need to work, like I need to work. Yeah. Do you remember that? I, th- I think I do remember it. Yeah. It well, I'm just, sure you had a lot of- It was just in the blue mat, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in the yeah. blue mat. And I just sort of sat there and I was just like, holy, f- like me and Murph are mates. Like, you know, we're good friends and we, we still are to this day. But it was that time for me when I learned like, it's, and I say this a lot, it's not about being liked, it's about being respected. Yeah. And that's one of the lessons you taught me the most because you were the leader in most of my years of in AFL and, and an incredible leader at that. But I think that was the biggest thing I learned from you was you can still be really good friends with people, but it's not all about being liked. It's about being respected. Yeah, and you're in, you're in a professional environment where it's it's all about the outcome at the end of the day as to whether or not you, you go on. But yeah. you need to invest in people. But I think over the a few years when I was there, like there was certain players that didn't get the best out of themselves because they weren't told by their peers about what they could actually, what they were good at and what they need to improve at. Mm. So uh, there was experiences that I'd seen over the journey that was making me feel like, well, I'm not doing the right thing by Dylan Buckley if I'm going to let him keep on carrying on like a, a fuckwit, yep. which unfortunately it hasn't really changed. No, me, but, it hasn't. Um, hasn't it, uh, <laughs> it, but I remembered you, it. You're doing a disservice to, yeah. to that bloke by not giving them honest feedback and what you think. So I was never one to rant and rave in front of the group. Like that's not mm. my style. I'll tell you honestly, face to face, what I actually think of you um, and what I think you can be, why you can be an asset to the footy, footy team. And I'd always try and bring it back to, if you do this and this, it's going to help us. Um, so that was sort of the main, that was my main leadership style. Mm. It wasn't getting out in front of the group and being motivational, although that's not a bad no, motivator no, no. sometimes. Good, good but, ups. Um, that was that was my real asset and that's something that I was really strong at. Um, and that's some of the knowledge I've been able to pass on to guys who are at that footy club at the moment is don't try and be a leader that you're not because blokes will see through it. Yeah. So don't think that oh, we need to be like this because that person's like that. That's what, that's them naturally. You, if you're in a leadership role because you're naturally good at whatever it is, grow that, make that your one would. Um, so I think they've got a really good um, cross section of, of different leaders at the footy club there at the moment that you know, I've got, um, got no doubt that they'll hopefully play finals next year and be some good times for us over the next 10 years watching them run around. Yeah, definitely. I think you speak about leaders like Doc, the way he's a leader and I think he's learned this a lot from you. He's one of the most lovely blokes in the world and he is such a good friend to me, but I think sometimes he forgets that we're not playing footy together anymore and still gives me really harsh feedback that I just, (laughs) I'm like, well, I'm not ready for that. Like I'm not in the, like we're just playing golf, man. I'm not ready for that like harsh feedback right now. Well, it's amazing what like being involved in like a footy environment, how much you just get feedback. Oh, you get feedback. Whereas, not that I really know what working outside of a footy club's like as, as such yet, um, but 
I don't think it's like any other workplace anywhere no. where you're constantly getting feedback about what you're, what you're good at and what you can improve at. I yeah. think people might have a, a one-off meeting a year where they get their feedback from their boss and it's like, well, you need to do this. Yeah. But yeah, football is it's a different environment from what I've from what I've heard anyway. Nice. That um, the feedback is just extraordinary compared Murph, to you'll actually, you, you'll actually start to miss it. It's 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 really strange. It was something that I was like, fuck, I'm so pumped to just not be told how shit I am anymore. Like it's gonna be so good. <laughs> but it's something where you all athletes and I think successful people in in life you have to crave feedback otherwise you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you, well, you don't know how to improve. <clears throat> yeah, and I've, and I've been been lucky enough to be exposed to a lot of um, you know intelligent people who are high up in, in business mm. and, um, you know, the, the top, you know, one or two percent that are really, um, the best at what they do are always craving that feedback because they want to, they want to get better. They don't just like just going along and thinking that everything's going smoothly. They're, they're always keen to get that feedback to try and grow and, and be better. And I've, I think one thing even just to add to that is now with feedback, you don't have to always agree with it, but just take it, like yeah. get it and then do what you want with it. Like cop it on the chin and then think, fuck, am I going to take that on board or am I going to leave it? Mm. Like, that's one thing that even when I was two, I was really young, people would tell me things. I'm like, all right, I've got to do this. I've got to change this. Someone said this. It's like, no, you can listen to it, but yeah. it doesn't mean it. You have to do it. Yeah. Has there, have you ever had any, like, moments, and I don't know, you were saying earlier there wasn't much leadership at the club at that stage where someone just said to you something and you were just like, holy fuck, like, wasn't expecting that. In my first couple of years. Well, anything just stands out, like, any time in your career, like... Uh, yeah, well, I think Rats was quite funny with one one game. So yeah. I can't remember if it was 2009 or 10. Like I had a pretty good game for what I thought. Like I, had, <laughs> I think I had mid-30 and kicked three. Yeah. So like pretty good. That's a, not a bad game. Yeah, it's okay. Um, average for some people. Yeah. But um, I sort of walked in. I was walking out to training. I still remember it. And he grabbed me and he goes, oh, how, how do you reckon you went on the weekend? I was like, oh, I went pretty well. I had 30, kicked three. I, was, I thought you were shit-ass, to be honest. I was like... <laughs> Yeah, right. And he goes, and these are the reasons why. I was like, oh, fair enough. Yeah. So um, that was why I said before about why I, I rate him because he was still able to, to bring me back yeah. and still able to go, well, if we're going to be good as a team, you need to be better in, this, in these areas. Mm. Um, doesn't matter what, you, what your stats were. I, mean, I couldn't give a fuck about your stats, but this is what you're not doing quite well enough. And if we're going to be a good side, this is where you need to to um to pull up your socks so to speak and yeah i still remember that chat when i walked out of that train i was fucking filthy at training like i was angry and i trained really well so i sort of worked out i needed to almost be angry every time i'd i'd go out there and, and play i played my best football when i was real really pissed off and mm. angry um and i think that's probably why i played really well with when i played with andy carrazzo because every warm-up he'd tag me in warm-ups because usually he had the tagging role yep on the opposition best player so it was, I reckon, every warm-up pre-game, normally it's a feel-good, get some touch. I fucking couldn't get a touch when Andy was playing on me in warm-ups. So I'd normally come in, like, fucking angry um, and usually play quite well. So um, anyway, I'm not sure how that, I got no, on to that point. But, yeah, um, yeah that, that sort of feedback when it just hits you between the eyes when you're least expecting it and you just got to cop it, um, I sort of enjoyed that. Yeah. You don't if want I, it. If, I'd, if it was justified. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Going back to that that playing time, and, and it'd be remiss of us not to touch on you as a player and, and what you did on field because it, it you know you absolute star. What was going through your head at these days? Like, what was going on with you? Because as I said earlier, like, there's so many things that I'm learning today that I just had no idea. You were you are quite a closed book in terms of you know your most social guy, like very friendly, but in terms of things that might be affecting you that no one even knew about or on game day, you did, you know, you flick a switch into another person. What do you think drove you the most, like playing footy? I was, I think when I was at my best, I was just a um, competitor. Like I just, I wanted to be the best. Um, And it didn't matter how well I'd gone that week. I'd always look at an opposition best player. I'd mark myself against the best player, the best mids in the comp. And whether I had the best game that weekend in the comp I still felt like someone else was better and I need to be better than them um so there was never a moment where I'd, I'd get happy with what I'd achieved I was always sort of just all right I'll bank that now I'm going to start again and I think that's that's the mark of the really the superstars who just over a really long period of time are just able to play at such a high level because mm. 
they just don't get satisfied with uh, achieving something. Uh, they're always trying to better themselves and grow. So there was a lot of the, I think Kripa is very similar and while well, she's like very similar in that boat, but Kripa, I remember four years ago, three, four years ago, just being like well, every, every week I'm going to mark myself against the best players in the comp and something that I sort of was trying to push to him was um, always have a really high expectation on yourself. And if you fall just below it, it's still going to be, you know, fucking good. So, um, yeah, as I said, the best players always had that ability to, you know, week in, week out, just just perform because they weren't happy with what they were doing the week week prior. So um, always acknowledge that sometimes you're going to have a poor quarter or a poor game, but don't let that flow into week to week. Mm. Um, so that was that was something that I felt mentally I was really um, I was really good at just resetting myself week to week and and always. Um, Everyone thinks I'm really, I was really talented. Like you're a number one pick, but I don't reckon I was. I've, I've had a bit of talent, yeah. but I was saying before, like, I'm not physically. The attributes I had aren't really. I'm you know, 178 and 80 kilos, and not really. I'm not really that quick. Mm. So like, I'd, I'd always worked really hard on the things I was really good at, which is like a good step, having good awareness, good decision making. So always uh, at training, just putting myself under enormous heat to try and hit targets all the time so that was just something that I was always um always pushing myself to be the best does that annoy did like I can imagine it does people thinking talent over hard work yeah because when you especially when you're a number one pick they just think oh you're enormously talented yeah um and it's been interesting oh not interesting but like you look at number one picks and um whether or not they're going to be superstars or not that the young bloke who got picked up last week, like everyone automatically thinks, well, he's got the best talent out of everyone in that yeah. draft. It's probably not a heap of difference between him and maybe the top five or six picks in terms of talent-wise. It's The next layer is just about the hard work and how hard mm. they're willing to push themselves. Um, so, like, yeah, as I said, I didn't, didn't really have the huge attributes physically. Like, I was never a top 10 runner at the footy club. Um, I always pride myself on in-game running, being able to be a power runner uh, and just being able to just be better under under duress and when it was time to deliver I'd always sort of see myself visualization was a huge part of why I thought I was pretty handy because I'd always been and been able to see myself doing something prior to it actually happening so when it actually occurred I was, I'd already been there and done that so, so that when you know you kicked the winner against Frio I dream, I dream about that most nights that's it pride leading into, into it, it. Leading, leading up to it but like you you but you've said this before and you, know, you would say this jokingly, but I think you were genuinely serious. Is you loved like clutch moments. You'd always dream about fourth quarter. That was your time to really do your thing. Yeah, like, and I think, and I've done a, f- a fair bit of work on a, a lot of reading and and watching of you know high class athletes. When you can't train, you can't train all the time. You just run yourself into the ground. So visualization and and being putting yourself in the moment. So then when the actual moment had come comes you're like well i've been here before i've mm. done this i've seen this i know what's required um so it wasn't always the you know selling candy kicking bananas with 30 seconds to go it was yep. like right I'm, I'm at a stoppage here this is this is who i'm playing against this is the stage of the game this is what's required of me um this is where i need my teammates to be so it's just little things that you can organize people around you as well which um which is handy so i think yeah you, you can't just always uh, visualize the the amazing things it's just the, the subtleties of, of sport and knowing where you and your, your teammates need to be to get the best outcome yeah well well i wish i did that <laughs> um how many how many coaches did you see in your crew uh one pagan pagan rats, rats mick bolts, bolts like J, jb for a jb 10 weeks caretaker yeah caretaker and teggy yeah. What was the last couple of years like for you? Um, I know you were saying before about your body, how, how hard it was to keep getting up. Um, we haven't even touched on your knee, but your knee's just as fucked as your shoulder, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not as fucked as my shoulder. It, it could have been, though. No. Yeah, there was like a period there through, and I, I regret this enormously, it was end of 2011 having a arthroscope in my knee. Like I had yeah. a tiny little bit of fluid in my knee from week to week in 2011, and I went in and had like a chondral shaving and, they drill into the bone to promote more growth. And like, I just, at that time I thought surgery was, you know, the only thing you you know, fixed everything. So, um, looking back on that, 
you know, surgery is a last resort. That's yep. sort of been my message to a lot of young players coming through is always 100%. look for avenues other than surgery because who knows whether you get a staph infection or who knows whether that surgery is going to work. Um, but yeah, so uh, I had probably three or four clean outs over a three year period and I was similar boat to Andrew Walker, who's pretty publicized about his issues with his knee. And yep. I reckon it was post game, I'd go get 50 mils, probably 40, 50 mils drained out post game and then train that Wednesday. So I wouldn't train up until the main session, train on Wednesday, get through that, swell up again, get it drained pre game. So there's probably a period there of 18 months I was getting knee drained twice a week just to, just to perform and play. So um, it wasn't until. Uh, going down a stem cell path. So taking fat out from my guts post season for three years in a row and injecting that into my knee that started to really turn the corner. So yeah. probably end of 2015, probably started to come good where I wasn't getting that fluid in my knee anymore. Uh, and then Penazan, which I've known I've talked to you about mm. off camera, but mm. um, I think that's helped me a lot as well. So I don't get any swelling in my knee anymore over the last few years in my knee, but went through a really tough period there for probably three years where I was just like, couldn't get out of a gallop really. Yeah. Like my, my knee was cooked, but. It, at, uh, were you told that that could be degenerative? So yeah, it was. It was. So yeah. I went up and saw a, a uh, specialist in Sydney, I think it was the end of 2013. And he, although I've looked pretty young, Bucker, we both have got, that's uh, in common with both yeah. of like we're, we're 15, but he said your knee looks like it's probably 35 and how many, wow. how many knees you got, how many, how many um, years have you got left on your contract? And I said, well, I think, well, I'm only 26. So yeah, well, you probably got maybe one or two left in you. So it was, um, it was pretty bad at that point. Wow. I sort of got pretty lucky that um, our doctor hadn't had been doing this stem cell research and after a, a few bouts or a few um, sessions of that over a few years, I started to really see the, the benefit in that. So I was, I was really lucky to be able to get to 34 in the end when I was probably staring down, staring down the barrel of, you know, you know finishing up early um, or late twenties really. So uh, I was lucky to, uh, yeah, to almost you know, dismiss that advice and yeah. push through and yeah, and get to as many games I did in the end, which was pretty lucky. It's a big call. I just want to emphasize that point on the surgeries. I reckon I was just agreed to shit too much without questioning it myself. Like yeah. I can't move my ankle and I, I don't think I need a surgery on it. I think it made it way worse. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Could yeah. I just, I just think like in, yeah, I think in, in AFL sport, they're pretty quick to, to go well, surgeries. Of, let's, let's get you back in 10 weeks. And if we go surgery, you can get back in eight. But if you just uh, had eight weeks off, you'd probably be fine. Well, that, that was so when I did my, when I <laughs> yeah. when I um, did my uh, syndesmosis and I missed like ten or eleven weeks. I'm like, we'll get you back in eight or nine. I was like, I'm not going back in for surgery. Yeah. Like, I'll just miss the rest of the season because yeah. I don't want another staph infection. And yeah. I think the best thing is to try and rehab it. So yeah, I learned that lesson probably too late about surgeries anyway. Mm. I only mm. had thirteen of them in the end. Yeah, that's not too bad. <laughs> Finishing off your your career um, at a time again where you know like mentally for you as I said again like the resilience and just like to keep going forward at every bit you go fuck this could be the next bit this could be the next coach this could be the next year maybe it might happen here to then finishing off with you know with Teague in the last couple how was how was that yeah so the back back of um god I can't remember what year it was yeah the tw 2019 2019 Teague took over and yeah. went back in the midfield played some pretty good football I think we won six out of our last 10 games or something so uh you know, football turned into it was fun again like you know winning nearly every every week in that back half of that year uh and i was 32 and i was i knew going on from that year i was going to be almost a role player like and i was content with that i just mm -hmm. thought we gained the list that uh we could almost we should be back playing finals and then obviously you know covid eventuated and then when you're uh 32 and you're away from your young kid you know, living up in the Gold Coast, not that that exciting, to be honest with you. When mm. you, I think if I was nineteen or twenty, it would have been an unbelievable ex experience. And but back end of it, you know, playing in front of no crowds, um, being away from from home for twelve weeks, being away from you know wife and son for six weeks, I just like I just hated every bit of it. Not being able to cook or anything, like, you mm. basically eating with everyone, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, can't do anything really. Um, I just I, football wasn't really that fun to me and I was really looking forward to thriving in the back half 
or last couple of years of my career and playing at the G most weeks and in front of big crowds and yep. um, hopefully winning. But, you know, it didn't eventuate, unfortunately. And then, yeah, just lost a, lot of, a bit of passion for the game throughout that period and my shoulder, I couldn't lift a weight. So um, couldn't do a lot of the things that were just easy for me to do when I was uh, at my best. So couldn't shrug tackles, couldn't, um, couldn't just operate. Uh, the way in which you should be able to operate playing AFL footy, so it was a it was a tough couple of years. But I just I was just trying to hang in because I wanted to play finals, yeah. and you just never know what what could what happen. happen. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't to be, unfortunately. Uh, to to get to three hundred games is an incredible effort. You know, life membership of AFL, absolutely unbelievable. But there was was there a time there where you thought that might not happen? I oh, definitely mid th- midway through last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got got dropped off for the first time in my career after 290 odd yeah. games, and yeah, I'm surprised you didn't actually give me a buzz that week to just see like how see you had it, yeah, see how to do it. And, yeah, you know. it was. Um, I should have called you. If I was going to call anyone. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, yeah, like I got dropped, and um, yeah, I was a bit like pretty pissed off because I'd obviously given a lot to the footy club. I actually played alright the week before, mm. um, but uh, yeah, I sort of didn't really see it coming, and sort of. I've got an understanding of what it was like to, to be left out of a footy side. And it was un- unfortunately after 16 years, yep. um, I sort of didn't get that experience, which I think I could have almost helped me. I should, yeah, should have been dropped early in my career. Yeah. yeah. I know what you mean though. If just you to understand yeah. what you know, other guys go through and um, knowing when your spot's in jeopardy in the side, I think it was certainly a wake up call to, to what that's like and the stresses that some guys have when they're playing for football. So there's obviously stresses that I had, but it's all, they're all very different. Um, so it was a, a different experience. And then I thought, no, I'll, I'll just, at one point, I was like, I've had enough of this. Like, you know, we're not playing in front of crowds. Like, we're probably not going to play finals. Um, I was a few games off playing 300, but it was probably mainly my wife sort of saying, well, you know, st- stick at it, like finish. Like, you've, you've put up with so much crap over your career. Yep. But obviously, you've had some good times. Just enjoy the last month or so, whatever it is. And um, if it happens for you, it happens. Um, and then I was more just buying off getting to that milestone so I could run out there with Max and, and Emi at the time. Um, and then that obviously didn't eventuate. And when you play your last game and you're sitting in the cricket nets at Adelaide Oval for six hours before the game and um, not having any of your family or friends or or anyone who's, who's meant a lot to you over that period, being able to be in the rooms after the game was, it was, a, it was a pretty hollow sort of feeling mm. when you're doing that um, and everyone's on Zoom. It's a bit of a disappointing way to finish finish your career. And Simo was, you know, the year before yeah. the crew as well. Like Simo, uh, we love, we, everyone loves Simo. We have played with him and his parents were just a fixture in the rooms of, of every game. Yep. And for someone to, to dedicate you know, their whole life to their career and their family to ride every bump with them as well, like the same as my family, to not have them in the rooms post-game at, the, at your last game was pretty tough for Simo. And then I felt the same thing the following year. So that was a, the, probably the hardest part. But I was sort of lucky that Big Bainy put together a bit of a video. That yes. A lot of people that um, meant a lot to me over the over the journey, which was which was great. Which went for like 40, 40 minutes. I watched <laughs> the night before the game. Not fuck, I was spent before going into the game. I was an emotional wreck. But um, that was probably the I almost likened it to almost my funeral, really. And I was actually there for my funeral where yeah. everyone saying these nice things about me. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, I've, I've, it was quite nice to be able to hear what some people. Or well, some of the impacts that I've I've had on them throughout their career, and you know, even even Cripper wrote me just a little um, a little letter. It was you know, a few lines, but uh, on what I'd meant to him throughout his career, and I'd like it was leading into Tiggy's meeting the night before the game. I started like tearing. I was like, an yeah. emotional mess here. Yeah, and after like the whole you know, period of my career, like I'd always, as you said before, putting up a bit of a wall sometimes. Never really like to show too much emotion, but like the last week was pretty emotional. But Huge. It was, um, as I said, not having family and friends and, you know, past teammates in the rooms. That was a, the, the hard part. And ideally, as I said at the start, having a thousand beers with everyone would have been nice yeah, too. Very nice. I'll get, get to that eventually. We can do that. Yeah. We'll definitely do that. Um, do you want to stay in footy? Uh, at the moment, I, I won't. I think it's really important for me to try and just get out of the, um, the bubble, so to speak, and um, I'm almost institutionalised, really, from yeah. being... You're that Brooks... <laughs> Brooks, exactly. Well, actually, Hopefully not, it doesn't end not the Brooks. ending, yeah, sorry. Um, yep. But, uh, you know, when you've been there 16 years, you go basically out of school where you're told 
you have your, your classes. So you, yeah. oh, you have your, your schedule, you do that. And it's the same thing as footy. Like it's, it's like being at school for the people that don't understand it. You get told what to do, where to be. Um, you've got to be punctual. You, you're a minute late, you're in trouble. You know, like it's, it's like being at school. Has that been so, the hardest thing for you leaving footy now? Like I know that was for me being like someone saying, what are you doing next week? And you're like, I actually have no fucking idea because I don't have a schedule. Like, I don't know where yeah. I'm meant to be. Like, what, how do people get to work? Like, what time is it? Like, it, it actually is, you have to go what, back to basics. What day is it? Yeah. Um, I've actually enjoyed it because the last few years, I went even in it for such a long period of time. Yeah. And I'd had this discussion with Juddy, like, you almost know mentally when you've had enough, when you're seeing some of these meetings and you're giving some of these, um, or you're sitting through something that you've been through like thousands of times before yeah. in your life. What, what am I doing? Yeah. Where am I at here? Like yeah. that, but there's always vanilla in some aspect of whatever job you're doing. There's always some negative to something. You're not going to have a, a job where you just love every part of it. So nope. I get that. And there was a lot of, a lot of good things about being involved at a footy club, like the, the locker room um, aspect, which, you know, you were pretty prominent in mm. throughout my, or your time. And mm. um, it's very vivid. A lot of, a lot of memories of you mm. uh, in, in the locker room, but um, there's obviously a lot of great things that go along with playing AFL football, yeah. but there was, there was times in certain, sitting in certain meetings that I was just like, geez, I can't wait to finish this. Oh, I, again, not that we were the same distance, but I remember there was a, a meeting I was in where I was like watching someone like how to man, how to man the mark. <laughs> and I was sitting there just going like, I reckon this might be time for me to stop doing this. Yeah. I, I don't really care about this anymore. Like yeah. this is, and everyone's sitting there going like taking notes, like don't get stepped, run quickly. And I was just like, oh, fuck, I, I really don't care about this mm, anymore. Yeah, there's there's quite a few things like yeah. that. Doing <laughs> a few exams on football. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to perform well in an exam on yeah. football. Like, and you're like, jeez, where yeah. am I at? Yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, yeah. What's uh, what's next for Mark Murphy in the future? I'm excited. Because you, in saying this, you were one, not just on field, but you've been really engaged off field your whole career. It's not something that, you know, you had to just do and you finish you you were always sort of setting up for something yeah so i sort of i, f I found that looking back I, my best years that i had playing I'd, i was always busy yeah. off field and doing something else and i was always um i've been lucky enough to be linked up with some some really good people in property that you know as well that i'll, I'll end up doing some some work with them um so the, pro the property industry uh is something i'm really excited about in terms of what area that's what I've, i'm working out at the moment yep. um but I'm, I'm really lucky to be able to you know, some really influential people that I can learn from at the, at the moment um, and just be a fly on the wall and, and take notes and, and learn as much as I can. So I know I'm not going to step into a big high paying job. Like I'm a realist, I understand that, but it's an industry that I really enjoy and, and learn. I'm looking forward to learning a lot about. So um, yeah, commercial real estate, property development, hospitality, like it's all something that, uh, yeah, interests me a lot. I want to challenge myself doing something completely different outside of football and then I'd always thought that being ahead of football was something that I would be really good at. Um, there might be a time for that down the track, but I think it's important for me to, to get more experience in the real world outside of football and, and have new challenges and, and then see where it takes me down, down, down the track. Yeah, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to already know. Um, you know, I'm very bullish on how successful you're going to be in whatever field it is because the transferable skills that you have um, and that are very prevalent today in our chat any business you know starting your own business or any person in business uh like the people you're working with now already know that you have um working in an afl club like we said feedback punctuality working like there's so many skills that you know people in sport not just football don't realize they actually have in business yeah and i think when i not that i've done anything but when i first got into work i thought fuck i'm gonna have to learn all this stuff again until I realised I actually fucking know this stuff. I've just got to change it from being a coach to a, yeah. you know, a coworker. Yeah. Um, and it's all the same thing. And you can really, yeah, I think it's really, really transferable. So I'm very excited of what's next. Yeah. No, it's been a nice pump up hanging out with you, but Mate, maybe we should catch up with you more. You're a fucking more often. Star. Maybe a bit of a build up on the table tennis table yeah. as well. No, I'll smoke you on that, my friend. I'm yeah, sure about that. I will smoke you. Um, it's been incredible, mate. I'm, you know, I think you know how much you mean to me. I absolutely love you. And, um, yeah, cannot thank you enough for, for coming on, being so open and honest, and can't wait for our friendship to flourish now oh. that we both retire. We'll go to some games next year. I can't wait to just walk in for 339-game um, combo, <laughs> just, like, sort of walking through the crowd. What, what a combination. Yeah, it's going to be good. We're going to really, really <laughs> set the tone. It'll be good times. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate, mate brother. Bye.